besides letting you do it. Loves me more than you. Let me record Sunday school just fine. They stopped loving you between Sunday school and church. Facebook Don't worry, says, it's not the only one. Hey, Facebook says that you've been exposed to extremist comments. I have been exposed. sacrifice of the cross of Calvary. Thank you for the privilege of our being able to assemble here today. Thank you for the ones that you brought together to be in our midst. 
I just ask that you would bless our service. You make it a very, very special time now. We praise you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
things that are happening this week that you don't want to forget about. One of them is Liam's birthday. Liam's birthday. So make sure to get him, you know, some really extravagant, elaborate, ridiculous presents <laughs> and uh, things that will take up the whole living room. <laughs> drum set. Yeah, the drum set's on the place, you know. I, what's that? Yeah, loud noisy toys. <laughs> yeah, loud noisy toys. So happy birthday, Liam. And Johnny just had a birthday last week. And uh, just kind of the birthday month. You June, June people are special. And uh, you mean a lot to me. Uh, we're taking the teenagers to camp this week, uh, this Friday. We're leaving early in the morning. A couple things about that. One, today's kind of the cutoff day for knowing who is going. And I do have some young people that we could still sponsor. If you'd like to sponsor a young person in camp and you haven't yet made me aware of that, the cost is $3,375. I've been messing up and telling people three fifty, so I just kind of go with the lower number, whatever I make up. It costs our church more than that, and of course costs, you know, as far as the effort that it takes. If you'd just be praying for us to just have a wonderful time, all the logistics that go into it. You know, people think that driving old vehicles is the tough thing about taking kids to camp. And that's actually the easiest part of it. Uh, being with teenagers 24-7 for nine days is the more difficult part of it. To do. Uh, if you can imagine all the things that arise on going on a road trip. We're going to be uh, going to Cumberland Caverns, uh, leaving 4.35 a.m., uh, 4.32, a.m. on Friday morning. And we're going to end up in the cave that night. So we'll start early in the morning. The kids will sleep on the bus all day. And uh, I'll drive all day, and then we're going to spend the night in the cave. So it's the three things that everybody loves the most, bats, spiders, and close confines in oh, open spaces. Yeah. And this is called an adventure, so it will be the time of a life. Actually, it's going to be an absolute lifetime. Where we sleep at in the cave is not in a confined space. It's actually massive. It would uh, The room that we'll sleep in would fit the public's building next door. And it's got a cathedral uh, it's got a pipe organ in it and a chandelier, yeah. a massive chandelier. I'm serious. It's, it's really all inspired to see, to see it. Really, it's a beautiful place. 30 miles of underground tunnels in Cumberland Caverns. And so we'll be doing some real spelunking. We'll have to weasel through little holes and get out of it. And that's easier for teenagers than it is for me. So pray for, <laughs> pray for us this week. And then we're going to go to, to Murfreesboro. And we'll combine with uh, Fair Havens Independent Baptist Church. We do every summer. They have a, they have another property where they have a pavilion outside of town. So we're on a separate teen activity with them. On Saturday, Sunday, we'll spend all day with them in church and that's just playing fun games. Then Monday, we check into the Bill Rice Ranch, and that's when the activity really starts. And we have uh, four times a day that we hear preaching, and the kids will have the opportunity to go on trail rides and have their cookouts and uh, play sports and I uh, just couldn't begin to describe all of the activities that we're going to be involved with. But the cost for nine days, all inclusive, not including, of course, your meal that you had for the trip up for your lunch, but all inclusive is $350, and that's just ridiculous if you think about it. You can't go to Orlando. One person can't go to Orlando for a day for $350 a person, you know, and we're doing nine days. But the real reason we're doing it is not just for the sake of entertainment. The fact is, is that the teenagers that go will make lifetime memories, and I'll forget about all the things they remember. <laughs> but they'll make lifetime memories all the good times. But their hearts are going to be impacted for Jesus Christ because we're going to go to a place where we have an atmosphere that's set aside. We're going to we're going to put down the cell phones and uh, all the media things, and we're going to spend a week where everything is designed around the preaching services, the preaching times. Everything scheduled around that. It's going to be a really special time. So if you know of a teenager that could possibly go, make it happen. You wouldn't believe uh, the obstacles Mrs. Price has to overcome in order to make the things happen so we can go to camp. And it's surprising to me sometimes we'll do so much to put a camp trip together. The minor things like, well, I've got a doctor's appointment. Cancel it. Move it. You know, I've got a, you know, I have this thing. This is a big deal. We only do it once a year, and you only get to be a teenager a few years out of your life. So make this happen. If your teenager goes, they'll go every year until they're 19. It's usually the way it goes. It's such a great time. So I want to promote that just a little bit. Cut off time for registration for that is today. If you'd like to sponsor a teenager or 
you could you could uh, do so in the offering this morning if you'd like to. You could write a check and put camp on it. Uh, just write that and it'll go toward camp. Or you could let me know and, and take care of it before that comes up. I want to um, just take a minute. I, I do want to read our um, what's in our bulletin with, the, with our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governor, governor, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these needs, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for life and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, events as a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such governments and to provide new guards for their future security. The men that got together and signed their names to this statement were men that were considered at the time this world's elite. They were wealthy, they were connected, and they were not living in the drudgery of many of those uh, that were really suffering at the hands of despotism. And so they sacrificed, as far as they knew, their lives. They signed the Declaration of Independence knowing we're going to die for this. Because it's worth dying for. And uh, today, some would have you to think that this country was founded to just commit evils and to put people down and to hurt them. These men were under no, uh, uh, they, they weren't deceived into thinking that they were themselves perfect. And today it is, it's like this crusade to destroy the character of the founders of the United States point out every bad thing they ever did, which I would submit to you that if those who are trying to do that were themselves scrutinized the way that they're scrutinizing others, if the conclusion is that a person who has not been perfect can do no good, then I suppose there'd be no hope. But we're privileged to live in a country where individuals make great sacrifices, and as we celebrate Independence Day, Quattro Julio, as others call it, we remember the great sacrifices that were made by people who thought they were going to lose everything, and in many cases actually did, because there's something was worth dying for. You know, I don't think anyone can really live until they have something worth dying for. So I'm thankful for the heritage of our country, and I will unabashedly say I love being American, proud to be an American, I'm so thankful. Um, I think you should be thankful for whatever country God has you be born in. You should have, because that ultimately evidences gratitude to God. But this is a special day in our country, and because it falls on Sunday, it's right for us to acknowledge it. And so, happy Independence Day to you. I hope that your celebration and your remembrance this day will be a day of wonderful reflection and gratitude. It's good for us to be grateful for sacrifices that others have made. It's good for us to see the good. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm about to the place where I would just recommend everybody take your television and just put it out on the street because it just filters in so much negativity and hatred and divisiveness that it's just not healthy for us. So put it away. Put it away today and just be grateful for the good things that God has done in your life. Thanks for being here. It's good to have some folks visiting with us. Charlie and Carrie are not visiting. They're home. Yeah, so amen. Everybody knows. <laughs> this is, uh, they're in their doing rightful place. We're so glad to see you. Carrie, we're so delighted that you're doing so well. We prayed for you, and we're just so thrilled that you're, that you're here. 
and we like Charlotte too. So, <laughs> Tyler's here. Good to see Tyler and, uh, and just other folks visiting with us for the first time. When you visit our church, you come as uh, you really come to, for whatever reason it's prompted to you. Maybe it's um, maybe you saw something or invited or you had an urge. But I'll tell you what it ultimately is. It's an answer to prayer. You're, you come as an answer to prayer. God prompted it. You responded to it. And you literally come as a token of God's goodness to us. And that's what we feel about you today. You're, uh, you're an answer to prayer from God. That's very special. And so we hope you feel as special as we know you are. And I hope that you feel like you're treated in such a way here today. Uh, if you're not treated well, I always tell people, just let Charlie know and he'll make it right. <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're glad you're here. We ask our visitors to fill out visitor information so that we can have a way of following up and contacting you in the future. That's the only thing we'd ask. We always take up an offering in our service because it's the right way to support a local church. We don't ask our visitors to participate financially in our offering. So if you please uh, just slip your visitor information in when it comes by, we'd be thankful for that. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing for the offering this morning as we proceed in our our service. God, it's, it really is a privilege that giving is, is so easy. It's really a matter of just listening to you and having you place in our hearts what you'd have us to do and then obeying and trusting you for the grace to be able to perform it. And it's just incredible that that pleases you, moves your heart, and that it can be seen as worship and adoration from us as we give. We desire today that you would know from us that, God, you're lifted up and uh, that we bow before you and acknowledge you as a worthy God. And we ask you bless the offering and bless each one who gives today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
church portion of the service. We'll have it away. <laughs> saw last week in chapter 19 and events we'll see this week, of course, are a culmination. Everything is building up to this point. This is the climax. Uh, as far as how we view things, I want to remind you that this is not everything there is left. So let's go ahead and begin reading. We'll just read verses 1 and 2 today. And then we'll pray for the Lord to help us, and we'll, we'll try to bring ourselves right up to speed and look at some events that have to do with the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and we'll pray for the Lord's help. Father, thank you today for the privilege of being in a place where we're free to open your word. But God, it's more of a special place because the particular book that's open. Thank you, God, that we know that this Bible is perfect and that it's preserved and that we have it. And that the events are not just merely ones that are possibilities that we look at, but these are absolute certainties. 
We look forward to one day observing with our own eyes the things that we hear and that we see and believe in our hearts from your word. I pray that you would help us to have hearts to believe. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's really a privilege to have a book which is written so simply and so able to be understood. Will you pardon me for a second? This door is open and it's driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one of you pranksters like just tampers with things just to throw me off. Somebody tampered with my so, clock this morning. I couldn't see what time it was. I my job in front of five minutes early. <laughs> oh, oh, you see you read it early. Well, there's no harm in that. <laughs> five minutes late, that's the danger, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, back in, back and back on subject. The portion that we're at in Revelation is, as I said before, it's a culmination of events. And I want to remind you how we began as we began our study. First of all, Revelation is written to be understood. If you want to understand future events, don't go to the bookstore and buy books. Open your Bible and read it. It's incredible how simply it's written. It's amazing, actually, when you for yourself study it and understand it. It's amazing how ridiculous the speculation becomes about the interpretation of future events, which are written and intended to be simply understood, but have been just clouded with all kinds of interpretation, which complicates God's Word. I realized years ago, and I really stand by this, and I, it's become kind of an operating idea in my life, that the more false a teaching is, the more writing it takes to explain it or defend it. And the more sources that must be cited, the more wrong something is, the more Puritan authors uh, that are unknown you have to read and cite in order to defend what you believe. You just read the Bible, and you interpret it as it's written. I'm not talking about being careless about reading the Bible, but I'm just carefully read the Word of God, compare Scripture with Scripture, you'll understand truth. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you'll say, you know, there's got to be more there than what I'm seeing because of something that's, that you see there. And then you dig. And you get into it, and you study, and you find out, yeah, there was more there. But it's not because it's a book that is intended to cloak truth. It's because it's a book full of treasures. And some treasures, the real valuable ones, you've got to really dig for to get those nuggets. But Revelation is written to just be one of those, here's all of this truth. And here it is laid out in such a way that anybody can understand it. So don't, don't fall into the trap of listening to what people say about Revelation. Read it. And look at what God revealed. Revelation is revealed, not hidden. And I know it's just, you've, you've heard that every time Revelation gets preached. Everybody tells you Revelation means a mystery revealed. But the problem is, is that it's preached like it's mystery concealed. So it's important for us to remember, this is truth exposed, truth laid out, truth given to you, not truth hidden from you. If somebody claims to understand something that you can't see in the Bible, it's because they're trying to conceal something. Or they're trying to bring out something which is concealed. And that's not what Revelation is even intended for. Revelation is chronological. The Old Testament of the Scripture isn't a chronological compilation. The Old Testament is arranged by topics. And oftentimes, especially if you don't read the Old Testament, you can read the Old Testament chronologically. Uh, but if you don't read it chronologically, sometimes these events that have to do with God's wrath and then they have to do with, you know, lions lying down with lambs and uh, they, there, there are events that sometimes mix up the tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand year reign of Christ, oftentimes and the Bible's not mixing them up, it's just that those events are so far off that it's talking about future events, future things and let me just ask you practically speaking, why do you suppose the millennial reign of Christ the thousand year reign, the millennium is a thousand why do you suppose it only gets 15 verses in the Bible. You ever wonder about that? I mean, it's a thousand years that Jesus Christ is going to be on earth reigning. Why do you suppose it only gets 15 verses in, you know, one chapter essentially, and all of it's not about the millennial reign? Uh, why do you suppose it only gets that much coverage in, in a book uh, that has 22 chapters? 
One chance in a thousand years. There's too much in to say between between this happens and this happens, so they have to condense it. Well, I mean, we've taken chapter 4 through chapter 19 talking about the Great Tribulation, the wrath of God. Right? What do you think? Because it's going to be perfect, uh, there's not a whole lot to say. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think it's exactly right. There, just, there isn't a whole lot to say. Uh, this last week, I, I got to see Pastor McClure up in Delray. I haven't seen him in a little while. So I, I sat down and spent some time with him. And uh, he, we were talking about different things. We were, we were talking about the phenomenon that often happens where a lot of people see a problem, but very few people do anything about the problem. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, for every person that does something, there are, are thousands of people that say somebody ought to do something. And he was telling me about it, something that happened in Delray years ago where the city council decided they were going to assess uh, for a, he said, for a good project, something that needed to be done. But they were going to assess all of the uh, organizations, all the institutions in town to pay for the project. So they assessed churches, the public schools, and uh, you know a few other just organizations for a project. And Pastor McClure just he, he saw that as a problem, you know, the, the arbitrary assessment of institutions to pay for a particular project. And here's his take on it. He said, you know, uh, we would gladly have just given money toward it, but you know, the public school is funded by the government. You want them to pay for a project that's a government project. It doesn't make sense to you know, you know. I mean, my wife and I agree on just about everything. We, we, we're fortunate that we get along really well. But you know, some couples can't can't agree about the route to drive home from church, you know, or where at which parking space to park in, in the parking lot. You know what I'm talking? It's perfect. And there'd just be no debate. There'd be no political party. You know, this side trying to accomplish things. You know, political parties ought to be trying to do the same thing, right? They just have philosophical differences. I don't, I'm not going to get political today. I don't intend to. I just want you to understand that the way things are, it's just everything, to accomplish anything, it just, it's just like a fight. It's a battle. Even to do good things, it's a battle. Have you ever been on a missions trip to build something with uh, contractors? I went on a trip one time with like five general contractors and all the rain their own companies. Them guys can't get anything done because they want to argue about it the right way to do it. And I finally said, you know, I, since I'm annoying, I'll just do it. You know, I started working. They're like, you ain't doing that right. I'm like, well, come show me. <laughs> the next thing you know, we're getting some things done. But the problem is, is people can't agree about anything. And the millennial reign of Christ is going to be a thousand years where Jesus rules and reigns. And if anybody disagrees, they're just wrong. That's pretty easy. And, and it's, not, it's not like when I say anybody disagrees, they're just wrong. It's God says. And the authority will be behind it. And, and the facts will be behind it. It will be the right way. Also, I believe one of the reasons why this is such a short discussion in the Scripture is not just because it's so simple when God does things. I think it's short because of the time. A thousand years really isn't very much time. You know, a good, good amount of time has passed since God created the world. And we understand from a careful study of the Scripture that the reason so much time has elapsed until the time, the seven years that's going to pass begins, which will begin the millennial reign of Christ. We understand that the reason for that is because of God's long suffering, His mercy. See, we're talking about major judgment. We're talking about total destruction of the wicked in chapter 19. And God doesn't want to do that. God doesn't want to destroy you. And I, this is the time today when if you don't know that you have eternal life, that you really need to tune in. This is so important. Friend, God's a merciful God. And this world has become sin-cursed because of the fall of man, the choice that man made to know good and evil by disobedience to God. Sin, because of that one choice, has passed on all men. And there's not been a single person who's innocent. All have sinned. And the Bible says all sin and come short of the glory of God, and that's a fact. And every one of us has been impacted by the sin of others and by our own sin in our own lives. And we can't do anything about what someone else has done. 
Matter of fact, when it comes to our own sin, there's a certain place where we can acknowledge our sin, but we can't erase our past. Can't make it go away. And in many cases, we can't even do anything about the things we've already done. It's done. But Jesus died on the cross for sin. He was God's perfect son. And the Bible teaches that that was God's plan from the foundation of the world. Before God ever created a man with the possibility of eating of that tree, God had the plan for his son to die as a propitiation, as a sacrifice, the ultimate lamb for sin. And in Genesis chapter 3, when we see the first fall of man, we see, along with it, we see God's promise of the virgin birth. It's not a mistaken language. It is prophecy that they that was understood throughout the ages of the virgin birth. When we talk about the seed of a woman, that's scientifically impossible. That's the virgin birth. And it's prophesied in the Scripture. And righteous men of all ages have looked forward to the fulfillment of that promise. And some 2,000 years ago now, Jesus Christ came to earth and was born at the exact time, on the exact day that was prophesied in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. And also in that book was 70 weeks. There was a left a final week before week is the measurement of seven years. And there's seven years, one week, so seven years, a week of years that's left. And that's what we've seen in chapters 4 through 19 of Revelation. For God is judging the world in that final week before the Messiah returns to rule and reign. And that's where we're at now. And I've said a lot by way of introduction this morning, but it's important also to remember that Revelation is written chronologically, not like the Old Testament. Revelation 1, verse 19, John is told to write the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. If you remember that, it will help you when you're trying to help other people to understand Revelation. To know that this is the book of the Bible that's written in order. And so first we're introduced to John, and he's talking about things that are in the past, and he's talking about the, the prophecy, how he was given the prophecy. And then we, he writes the things which are present, where he begins at the end of chapter 1 to write the letter to the seven churches, goes through chapter 3. And so that's the present tense. From there we go to the future tense, which to the future which begins... When Jesus Christ calls his saints up out of the world and God removes his Holy Spirit, preventing evil, preventing sin, and God begins at that moment, at that time, to judge the world. We've seen all these judgments culminating ultimately in the destruction of those individuals which willfully took the mark of the beast in their hand and their forehead and refused to have the mark of God in their foreheads. And they came out to do battle against God. And the result of it was simply that God just prepared a pathway for them to come right to him. And here they come, like a bunch of lemmings, like a bunch of drums, in rebellion against God, against Jesus Christ. And it's not a close battle. They come to fight against Jesus, and we're all following him. The saints are following him. And Jesus speaks, and the wicked are destroyed. That's how close it is. And I remind you today, don't give place to the devil. We see in chapter 20 in our text today, in verse 2, there was an angel that came down from heaven. In verse 2, he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So the devil's given, he's, he's given three names that we understand by. He's that serpent, the old serpent, the one we're introduced to in the garden. He's the dragon in Revelation, and he's the devil. Satan, all these names that are ascribed to this individual. And he's a powerful individual, and he's been destroying things from the very beginning. It's been causing a lot of trouble. And yet we see an angel from heaven come down and grab him. And this amuses me. Because we make the devil too much. He's not even as powerful as God's angels that put him in jail, that would lock him up. You get that? There's not this battle between good and evil, God and Satan. No, my friend, good has won. Righteousness always wins. God's holiness. Wickedness doesn't intimidate God's holiness. Wickedness flees out of the presence of holy God. It's not this epic war of good and evil, my friend. There's good. And that's the only thing that matters. 
Evil has an ultimate judgment. There isn't this battle between Satan and God. You know, it's not like one of these cartoons where you see, you know, these action figures flying around through the air. There's the force of good and the force of evil, you know, and it looks like the force of evil is going to triumph, and then all of a sudden the force of good, you know, makes them slip on a banana peel and wins. <laughs> it's not just some kind of happenstance of action. It literally is that God is allowing evil so that he can be merciful to whoever turns to him in repentance. But what God has done for Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. If you make it into the millennium and you're not saved, no, I mean, sorry, you make it into tribulation and you're not saved, there are going to be individuals that turn to Jesus during that tribulation time, during that tribulation period. We know that 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel are going to receive the mark of God in their foreheads and are going to follow him. We know that there's going to be the prophets that preach the truth, and people are going to hate them, but they're not going to be able to oppose them. And anytime they come to destroy them, they just breathe out fire, and whoever opposes them is destroyed. And these are prophets of God. And there are going to be some individuals that turn to God and they humble themselves and they bow themselves and they follow righteousness. And they're going to survive the tribulation and all what stories they're going to have to tell. It's not going to be, ah, oh, you know, I, I barely made it, you know. It's going to be, I follow Jesus. And the Bible says they're going to be with Jesus in this millennial reign of Christ and they're going to reign with him triumphant. A thousand years. Now, where are we going to be in? Well, last week we saw the Lord Jesus coming from heaven, and we saw those individuals following him. And that's us. So we're there in the reign of Christ. And were you to read back into Ezekiel 47, and you'd see the Gentiles sojourning in the land, you're going to see God beginning to rule and reign. There's also implications that King David's coming back, and he's going to have a major position as that great king of Israel uh, that uh, God is going to use in the millennial reign of Christ. It's going to be really something. And what's going to happen is that on this very sin-cursed earth on which you and I live, everything's going to be, for the first time, absolutely perfect. Now, what's incredible about that is that everything's going to be perfect on a sin-cursed earth. I think that's neat, don't you? You know, that's why global warming doesn't leave me awake at night. Do you believe in climate change? Yeah, well, church sure changed this week. Did you see, like, it was 82 all week long, and yesterday must have been like a line of a zillion degrees. It was hot out yesterday. And, uh, you know, so it definitely warmed up this week. Do you believe in climate change? Yeah, climate's changed. It does. Climate's changed. Am I worried about it? Am I losing sleep over it? No. God's going to take this sin-cursed earth and he's going to destroy a third of it. He's going to destroy a third of the waters. A third of the greenery is going to be destroyed. And then all these curses are going to happen to it. And then in the end, he's going to fertilize it with the blood of the wicked. Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign it in a perfect way. Think what God can do with a sin-cursed world. And we're going to see next week, that's not, not next week, week after next week. We're going to see next week, or the week after next, that's not as good as it gets. Because God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And they're not going to be sin-cursed anymore. But this is literally Jesus Christ coming back and just fixing everything. I want to say a little more about that and then make some application from a very simple message here today. Verse 5, we see another, another important message. The rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now these are dead who have died during the tribulation. Individuals who have died from natural and unnatural causes during the time of tribulation. The unnatural cause ultimately is that Jesus destroys them. And they get to be, their bodies going to the graves. Do so you remember what happens 
before the tribulation begins. The bodies of the saints come up out of the graves, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the believers in Jesus Christ meet them in the air, and we're ever going to be with the Lord. So we're going to be here in this millennial reign. Yes, we will. We'll be there. And we're not going to die again. But those individuals that died during the tribulation, their bodies are going to be in the ground. Or they're going to be buried. They'll be in the sea. They'll be in the ground. They'll be wherever it is that they are put away. They're not going to be resurrected until after the thousand-year reign of Christ. The question is, will people die during the millennium? Well, the answer is, yeah, people will be able to, not us. And the Bible says in verse 4, these individuals that survived the tribulation lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So these individuals that didn't die during the tribulation will never die. They'll be just as privileged as those individuals that go up into the rapture. They'll never suffer the second death. And that's what the scripture is explaining to us. I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, friend, I don't want to be part of the tribulation period. But there's hope for those that are, that they still don't have to die. You know one of the great hopes as a believer is? We can avoid the thing nobody wants to do. And that's that appointment that we have with death. That's one appointment I don't want to make. I, I'm not afraid to make it. Um, you know, I don't know whether I'll die with courage or die like a coward. But I'll get it done either way. I've seen both. I've seen individuals that just showed so much serenity, so much courage, and were just... My grandmother went to be with the Lord two years ago, and all she wanted to talk about was the millennial reign of Christ and being here. And then she, you know, she she just was... She was just ready. She was resolved. And she was just ready to die. My great aunt Margie died a couple years ago, and she didn't get saved until she was 100 years old. But she died. And she just, she, when she got saved, she said, Now I'm ready to meet my Lord. And for the two weeks that she stayed alive, she was ready to go. And she, and she left within two weeks. She made it to 100. That was a goal. She got saved. And good thing she did. And then she said, I'm out of here. And you know, it really wasn't a big deal. To die. I've seen I've seen people that are crying and <coughs> they're moaning and they're angry and they're bitter and they're all these things and they're, they're, they're screaming and wailing. I've just seen is I've seen terrible deaths too. You say, Pastor, which one are you going to be? Well, I'd like to be courageous. But I'll get it done either way. I notice people who don't want to still do it. They get it done. Right? And so I don't have to worry about it. But you know, if I had my brothers, you know, most of us agree, right? I have some friends that want to go off, you know, go out with a bag. They're like, you know, I want to be like in a high speed impact. You know how you've seen that, you know. You know? Um, and I don't want to get morbid here today. But there's just some people that's how they think. Most of us though are the, you know, we want to go in our sleep kind of people, right? Most of us are like, yeah, I'd like to go to sleep and and then just wake up. You know, just wake up in the presence of the Lord Jesus and that's all would happen. You know, it's a good, a happy accident. Whatever, that'd be great, right? But better than that would be to not die at all. To be to be out knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus and saying, you know, Jesus is coming any time. And then all of a sudden you see him in the sky and you're like, see, there he is right there. I told you so. <laughs> and you see the bodies of the saints coming out of the grave. Just like when Jesus said it's finished on the cross and the saints came out of the graves up to that time. That, see, you know, the bodies of the saints go out of the graves and, and uh, it'd be cool if I was around in one of the graves where I knew some of the people would come out. I'd be like, hey, where you been? Their bodies reunited with their soul. They're temporarily clothed. But we're all going to meet the Lord in the air. We're ever going to be with the Lord. We're going to be part of this millennial reign of Lord Jesus Christ. It's important for us to remember some other truths. Would you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6? I want to point this out for us because I think that this is, that there ought to be practical application which helps us when we understand these things. read the first few verses. First Corinthians chapter 6. Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, and you are unworthy to judge, ye, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? 
This is really important. Paul is pointing out to the church of Corinth, you know, you guys are taking each other to court. And the people that are judging are actually wicked people. They're, they're unredeemed. It's a really terrible thing in the church for that something like that to happen. What a bad testimony for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this has happened. But Paul points out something. He said, why can't you handle yourselves? Now, we're not talking about usurping uh, the law. We're not talking about ignoring what the, you know, God's institution of government has the right to do. We're talking about believers not able to settle problems with themselves. And I want to remind you, friend, that thou shalt judge. The Bible says, judge not, that you be not judged, right? Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. For which manner you judge, you shall be judged. Yeah, right, friend, but someday we're going to be judges. 